computer so then I can upload it for people who aren't here. Uh, so end rhyme is important in Shakespeare uh, because, and I guess for the folks who are, who are gonna be watching this as a recording, I'm running the review for Othello, the assessments next class. I should have started recording earlier, but I forgot. Uh, so uh, at the ends of scenes, at the ends of soliloquies, uh, when Shakespeare really wants something to feel important, he puts it in couplets. A couplet is a pair of rhyming lines that go A, A, B, B, C, C. And so when Shakespeare wants to underscore something of importance, uh, he'll, he'll throw a couplet in there. And I may ask you to find a couplet uh, for one of the questions and to put it in and explain why it's a couplet. Uh, you should be able to show me that and pick that out. Uh, remember that we had the, the rap battle between the Duke and Brabantio. One of the ways that Shakespeare um, differentiates classes is people of low class uh, talk in, in what we call prose, just the way a regular person would talk. Somebody of higher class is going to talk in iambic pentameter. So there are going to be 10 syllables in every line. It's going to have that pattern to it. And people who are like the upper crust often will talk in, in rhyming couplets like the Duke does. Um, and then well, again, when Shakespeare wants to underscore something, he'll throw end rhyme in there. Uh, unrequited love. This is a theme that we saw in sonnets when you love someone and they don't love you back. Again, that is clearly a, a thing that's present in Othello. Um, Rodrigo loves Desdemona, but Desdemona does not love him back. Bianca loves Cassio, but Cassio does not love her back. You could argue, if you wanted to make the argument, that Iago loves Othello, but Othello doesn't love him back in that way. I mean, if you want to make the argument that Iago is gay, you can. Um, I think that that uh, Kenneth Branagh played that up a little bit in the film version, whereas it's very understated in the uh, print version, but I think you could make that argument if you wanted to. Uh, Shakespeare uses a lot of sound devices, but we haven't stopped and looked at them. Remember, alliteration is repetition of first consonant sounds. Harris hates hamburgers. Consonants is repetition of last consonant sounds. Harris hates hamburgers, those fierce darts. Assonance is repetition of vowel sounds. I don't think I put any sound device questions on there for you. So I think you're okay with that. Uh, but there's a lot of figurative language in Shakespeare. Uh, he uses it all the time. You should be able to find a simile if I ask you to find a simile. Remember, a simile is a comparison using like or as. That one's easy because you can just you know, go here and hit control F and go like, oh, is it not searchable? Why has it got to be that way? Um, but you should be able to identify like and as. I will try and save this as a document that is searchable. It is a, I think if I just upgrade it to a, um, a Google Docs document and save it that way, it should be searchable. So I'll, I'll make sure I do that for you. Um, where was I? Renaissance terms. Right. Uh, a metaphor is a comparison not using like or as when, when you compare something to something else, but there's no like or as. You could use is, that's the easiest one, but lots of things are metaphorical without it being super obvious in the construction of the sentence. Hey, if you guys have any questions as I'm doing this, just ask. I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, we looked at conceits in some of the poems. That was that love is like a stapler thing where you look at it. It's an extended metaphor, usually comparison, comparing uh, idea or emotion with a physical object. We did have a couple of these in Othello. I think early on, um, <clears throat> Iago made this really extended metaphor between uh, our bodies and gardens and our, our souls as gardeners. You guys remember that? Uh, where we decide what to plant and whatever we plant is what we're going to harvest when the time comes. So if you fill yourself with, um, you know, jealousy, for example, you're going to have a harvest of bitter herbs uh, when the time comes. So there was a big old conceit in there. Um, oxymoron is two contradictory words placed together. Cold fire, bittersweet. Those are, those are obvious examples. Um, I guess, uh, there are some oxymorons applied to Desdemona throughout the story. He calls her a fair devil. I think that would be one that is a good example. Fair means uh, beautiful, but also good and kind. Um, like, you know, that's, that's obviously weird when placed with a devil. Uh, paradox is an impossible or illogical statement to hold some figure to truth. We looked at that poem in which uh, Edmund Spencer said that his love was like to ice 
and he was the fire and the hotter he got for her, the colder she got to him. And we looked at that paradox. I don't know that we ever had any clear paradoxes in Othello that were developed in that way. Hyperbole is a fancy word for exaggeration. There was hyperbole all throughout Othello. For example, uh, I don't know, Montano gets stabbed and he's like, I'm dying. And he, he never died. Like, you know, like he's obviously exaggerating things. But you also have emotions that are exaggerated and things like that. Uh, personifications giving human traits, actions, or emotions to inanimate objects. I don't know, treating a handkerchief like a human being would be a pretty good example of a personification or the moon saying the moon has emotional traits would be an example of personification both of these things happen in Othello you should be able to find those apostrophe is talking to something that cannot respond we looked at it in poetry like talking to desire or talking to sleep Othello has a scene where he talks to a candle uh right and the candle is clearly not going to respond but uh what's he doing there why is he doing it uh, that's something that you can look at. Uh, we've talked about symbols. There are a lot of symbols in Othello when something represents something else. In fact, I want to talk about symbols in Othello. It's a good segue. Let's look at um, the Othello themes and imagery sheet right now. So uh, the symbolic images, these are the things. There are other things that are symbolic in Othello, but the symbolic images, the things that are most symbolic are obviously the handkerchief, you know, representing Desdemona's virginity or her virtue or the love that Othello has for Desdemona and what happens when she loses it or loses it in his eyes you know that's probably the most and and when you go and you look at the scene where it describes the handkerchief as being made by like some crazy um Egyptian witch uh and it's it's made out of like magical silkworm thread and it's got little strawberries on it that are dyed with mummified virgin hearts like you start putting these things together and it's very clear what the handkerchief symbolizes. So it's it's probably the easiest and strongest symbol, but we're using darkness and light in a symbolic way. Um, literally darkness and light are in the story, either the, the level of light in a room, whether it's daytime or nighttime, um, and literally also maybe a skin color, you know, like whether somebody's white or black. But symbolically darkness and light come to mean good and bad right, uh, whether somebody is has good intentions or evil intentions. And the whole play is played around this idea that if we can convince Othello, if Iago can convince Othello that Desdemona's soul is dark instead of light, uh, then he'll, you know, act in a different way. So darkness and light ends up being sort of a suffusive imagery throughout the entire story. Poison, we looked at poison. It's used, I don't know how many times in the play to represent jealousy. It also connects with Iago as a snake character. You could talk about animal imagery. Um, you could look at how the, the animals that characters are compared to end up being symbolic of who they are as a person, whether it's Iago as a snake or Desdemona as a sacrificial lamb or Othello as a Barbary horse um, or a toad, or, you know, like depending on, on the, the ones that we're looking at. Blood is a smaller image in this one. I think it, it comes to represent guilt. Uh, when you see people bleeding, uh, you know, Othello, Desdemona dies a bloodless death, right? Like she's killed in a way that there's no blood on her. If the blood represents guilt and she is bloodless, she has a guiltless death. Uh, whereas the characters that die bleeding are Emilia, who's guilty of stealing the handkerchief and giving it to her, her husband. And Othello, who, who stabs himself and bleeds out all over the bed, uh, and he's guilty of, of murdering his wife. So you can look at the blood as symbolic of guilt. I think that makes, makes good sense. There's plenty of angel and devil imagery throughout. Um, Desdemona often gets compared to an, an angel, and uh, Iago is often implicitly or explicitly compared to a devil. Um, I think that's enough to go with, but um, those are all symbols that I think are useful to you when you're looking at analyzing Othello. Any questions so far? Okay, so those are all poetry terms and a lot of them apply to Othello. Now we're getting into the ones that are, are straight drama terms. These are the ones that are more likely all going to appear on the test. There may be a few here or there that don't, uh, but be aware that most of these are the ones that are gonna be tested. Um, when we look at drama itself, uh, in other words, putting on plays, that drama is another word for putting on plays, we found that there were two types of drama 
um, that occurred primarily. One is what we call comedy and one is what we call tragedy. Othello is a tragedy, not a comedy. A comedy is a story that starts with problems and has a happy ending, um, usually resulting in the marriage, in a marriage or the social advancement of the protagonist or both. Uh, whereas a tragedy is a story that begins well for the protagonist but ends in disaster. Obviously Othello, uh, if it's the story of Othello himself is clearly a tragedy. If it's a story of Iago, I guess it's, it's also a tragedy because you know, it ends in disaster for him as well. Uh, so you should know those two definitions and be able to apply them. I do wanna point out though that I, I think one of the things about Othello the play that's worth noting and worth thinking about is even though the story is a tragedy, it's got a lot of comic elements. Like there are lots of funny moments in this tragic story and, and Shakespeare sort of flexing his muscles. I mean, obviously we have the clown and, and some of those, you know, comic relief moments where we compare bagpipes to farts and STDs and things like that. But we also have like the drinking scene where Cassio loses his job. That's a really important part of this plot, but it's hilarious. We also have that scene again, which is really intense and Othello comes out of it wanting to murder Cassio, but where Iago is talking to Cassio about Bianca and uh, Othello is like hiding and listening. That's kind of funny uh, throughout. So it is, a, it is a tragedy, but it's got a lot of comic elements in it, which I think is interesting. Uh, so we could talk about the tragic hero, uh, the protagonist of a tragedy, generally a person of high social status with a character flaw that will ultimately result in his or her downfall or death. We call that character flaw the tragic flaw. Uh, it's a character trait often taken to extremes that inevitably results in the tragic hero's downfall or death. In Greek drama, it was most frequently what we call hubris or excessive pride, right? Like Icarus is uh, got some wings on and his dad's like, hey, Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun. And Icarus is like, shut up, boomer, right? And he starts flying up to the sun. He's like, I'm higher than Zeus. And then, of course... He crashes and burns, that's hubris. But does Othello suffer from hubris? He doesn't seem to, if anything, he's got a lack of self-confidence. And you could say that the driving factor of uh, what happens in Othello is jealousy, but is jealousy Othello's tragic flaw? Is he inherently a jealous person? Does, does his own jealousy lead to his demise? So the question of what is Othello's tragic flaw is a question that critics and, and viewers of the play have asked themselves for generations. And different people come up with different answers. Some people do think it's pride that, you know, he, he murders Desdemona instead of letting her go because he's so proud and he feels that he's been betrayed and he can't allow that to stand. And so he has to take action on it. Uh, some people have argued that it's his self-righteous nature that is his downfall because as soon as he thinks that his wife is evil, he feels like he has to sit in judgment over her and then enact her punishment. And if he didn't do that, things would have turned out differently. Uh, personally, from my perspective, it's his lack of self-confidence that ends up being his tragic flaw. And this ties in with one of our central themes, which is uh, racial discrimination, right? Like he, at the very beginning of the story, hires Cassio as a second in command because he's insecure about his ability to communicate in advanced Venetian society. And then when Iago starts working on him, it turns out that he's insecure about how old he is compared to Desdemona, but also his race and his ability to talk. And it's these insecurities that allow Iago to get that thought inside his head. And so, you know, is his insecurity his own fault? I mean, if you're being told by society that, that you have to be a certain way or if they're judging you for being a certain way your entire life, like he is in act one before we even meet him. Shakespeare gives us all these negative things about him. Um, how do you resist that your entire life? I don't know, but we could, we could debate the tragic flaw of Othello for quite a bit. Um, you just have to think about one and pick one and be able to support your argument, whatever it happens to be. Uh, any, any questions or comments on tragic flaw? Okay, uh, so then we got comic relief. I already mentioned that that's a funny moment in the otherwise tragic or dramatic work designed to release tension. Those scenes of the clown are the easiest ones to find uh, where the clown shows up and makes puns on the word lie or 
you know, picks on, on musicians or whatever. Uh, you also need to know the difference between the kinds of writing you find in a play. And these four are really important. And some of y'all were struggling with this uh, during classwork. So the biggest struggle we have is the first three. Most people understand dialogue. Die is the old Greek word for two, right? So when you have dialogue, you end up with two or more characters who are in conversation with each other. The vast majority of all plays is composed of dialogue. One of the things that a play lacks is what we call a narrator, right? There's no voice of the author um, telling us what people are thinking or what they're feeling or what they're experiencing. And so everything in a play has to happen through conversation and almost all of it's through dialogue. The only time you don't have dialogue going on is when you have soliloquy, aside, or monologue, and you need to know the differences and be able to spot the differences between these things. So the easiest thing to, to do is just to go through each of them. Soliloquy has the word solo built into it. The key that makes something a soliloquy is you have one character all by himself or herself on stage. Iago has the vast majority of soliloquies in Othello. The end of almost every scene in which Iago is a major factor ends with Iago making a soliloquy, right? He tells the audience his plan. So it's a, a dramatic technique in which one person is on stage, they're alone, and they talk to the audience. And uh, it's understood, it's an implicit understanding between the audience and the actor that everything they say is just thoughts in their head, even though they're moving their mouth. If the play was like a movie, we wouldn't have them move their mouth um, at all. You would just hear their thoughts by, by sort of like a narration, but they, they didn't have that kind of technology back in the day. And so we end up with um, soliloquies. So you got to pay attention to who enters and who exits. And you've got to find a time when there's only one character on stage. Everybody else who has entered has left and there's one person remaining then we can call that a soliloquy. Shakespeare plays with this a little bit, like he gives Othello a soliloquy while Desdemona's asleep. So technically there's another character on stage, but she's not awake and so she can't hear what he's saying. And so you get a couple of weird things that, that sort of bridge the gap. Um, an aside, literally, look at this, a side, right? It's a side conversation. So you end up with more people on stage. It's not just one person on stage, there's more people on stage. And uh, one or more of them, but never all of them, that's important, never all of them, share a side conversation or a comment, a quick thought that the audience overhears, but the other characters pretend that they don't hear. This one's really easy to find because most of them have a side written next to them so that you know that they're asides. Yeah, that's fine. Not all of them though. So occasionally there's an aside that is part of a bigger speech and you miss that it's got that notation, uh, but they're relatively easy to find. Monologue is something that people confuse sometimes with soliloquy because mono means one and you think solo is sort of one as well. Just remember that solo is alone. It's not one, it's alone. A monologue is when one person's making a long uninterrupted speech directed at other characters on stage and all the other characters are listening. So they're not pretending not to hear, they're they're listening. A good example would be when the Duke asks Othello to tell how he made Desdemona fall in love with him. And Othello gives like a two page speech that nobody interrupts. That would be an example of a monologue. Similarly, whenever Iago is trying to talk Rodrigo into something, he tends to monologue. He has a big old speech and Rodrigo doesn't interrupt him. Uh, and that would be an example of monologue. Does anybody have questions about any of these? For this is one of the areas that you guys are struggling with the most, and I want to make sure that you can find them, that you understand them uh, before I, I assess you on them. If you want to prep for this, uh, one, one way that you can, uh, I don't know, there are people who need to have an A to pass the class. So if that applies to you, it would be maybe worth your time to go through um, the Othello uh, story and find your examples and write them down um, so that you just already have them and you can answer it. Because uh, I am going to ask you some of these, you know, find me an example of a soliloquy or find me an example of an aside or whatever it happens to be. 
All right, we also looked at stage directions. Those are notes from the author and playwright to the actors. These are usually in italics and in brackets. For example, exit stage left or aside. Uh, just to, here, let me, you know, here's, here's a stage direction. Angry, defensive. Um, at the end of every act and scene, it tells everybody to exit. You know, here's exit above. Uh, enter below, Brabantio and servants with torches. All of these are stage directions. They should be pretty straightforward. Also, this is how you know when somebody's on stage by themselves for a soliloquy. You, you can track it, like right here, we've got, well, we got a, uh, I'm trying to think of where the first soliloquy shows up. I think it's at the end of act one. So, you know, here's the Duke and everybody talking and we got lots of people on stage and, um, you know, then we have some people leave. The Duke leaves with the officers and the senators and they're all gone. And then Othello and Desdemona leave. Um, Brabantio leaves. He leaves right here with the Senate and officers. Othello and Desdemona leaves and that leaves Iago and Rodrigo on stage, right? And they have a conversation. And at the end of their conversation, you can see Rodrigo leaves. And so if you've been tracking who's on stage and who's not, you know, the only person left is Iago and uh, he's left with a soliloquy. So the, the stage directions are how you get to that uh, just by paying attention to who arrives and, and who leaves and, and those sorts of things. Uh, we looked at irony. Irony plays a really, really, really important role in Othello. So you need to be able to identify it. There are three types of irony. Um, we generally refer to situational irony as ironic, but uh, there's the three kinds and you need to know all three. Situational irony is when actions taken have the opposite of the intended result. So a good example of a situational irony from early in the play is we know that Rodrigo loves Desdemona and that he's trying to get her to love him um, and so he's obviously been spending a lot of time trying to, to change Desdemona's mind. Well, early on, we find out that uh, there's essentially a restraining order out against him by Brabantio. And so he tried to get Desdemona to love him, but actually he made her dislike him more. That would be situationally ironic. He took an action that had the opposite of the intended result. Um, so there's that. Uh, verbal irony is when words spoken have the opposite meaning of their literal meaning. Um, and we as readers understand that, um, you know, but maybe, maybe the characters do, maybe the characters don't. There's lots of verbal irony. For example, when Iago's speaking, he likes to say things that have two meanings. And, uh, you know, the characters themselves only get one of them. Uh, but also you have lots of moments where Othello says things like, honest Iago has taken order for it. And you're like, yeah, honest Iago, right. Uh, all of those things are verbal, verbally ironic. In a play, you tend to have more verbal irony than in a novel because everything's through dialogue. Uh, and then dramatic irony is when the reader or audience knows something that a character does not know. And Iago has been giving us dramatic irony throughout the entire story by giving us soliloquies that tell us his plan. So we know the plan, but none of the other characters do. We know that Desdemona did not cheat on Othello. Othello doesn't know that. Um, you know, you can go through and you can find all of these examples and uh, identify them as dramatic irony. Any questions on irony? Anybody feeling insecure about any of those? You guys all good? All right, cool. Uh, next, we have poetic justice. It's when a character gets what they deserve, whether it be good or bad. And authors tend to give some characters poetic justice and deny other characters poetic justice. And it's almost always linked to the theme or lesson of a story. So in the tragedy of Othello, uh, Desdemona does not get poetic justice. She does not deserve to be murdered by her husband because she has done nothing wrong. She deserves to have a long, happy relationship with her husband. Um, Shakespeare denies her the poetic justice that she deserves and gives her the opposite of that to prove a point. What's his point about women and relationships and you know those sorts of things? Similarly, Iago is um, a horrible human being who deserves to be punished, not rewarded. 
and he ends up getting punished, right? Like theoretically, Shakespeare could have written it so that the whole plan worked out and Iago became the new general. But instead, the thing unravels at the last minute because of Emilia, and Iago is then stabbed by Othello and assigned to torture. And so he gets the poetic justice that Shakespeare um, gives him. Why? You know, what's the lesson about lying? What's the lesson about trying to manipulate people that we get through Iago and what happens to him at the end? And uh, then you've got Othello. Does Othello deserve to die by his own hand? Well, yes, after he killed his wife, right? So he gets poetic justice and he sort of gives it to himself, uh, which is fitting because he thought what he was doing to Desdemona was justice. Uh, and it turns out that it was not. And so he sort of then becomes his own judge, jury, and executioner, kind of like he was for Desdemona, and brings it all together. Um, all right, so then we have some character terms that you need to know. All of these are various character types, and a lot of them, in fact, all of them are in binaries. So these two go together, these two go together, and these two go together. And for all of them, it's sort of like you're either or. First, the distinction between protagonist and antagonist. Protagonist is a moral neutral term for the main or primary character. We had an argument in class about whether Othello or Iago is really the protagonist of Othello. For the sake of all of our answers, just assume that it's Othello. He's, he's the most logical choice. Um, it's a tragedy. He's a tragic hero. He's, he's the protagonist. The antagonist is the character who is opposed to the main character. And in this case, I think the antagonist is clearly Iago. He's the one who's opposed to Othello and destroys his relationship and all of those kinds of things. So that's protagonist and antagonist. Then you've got round and flat characters. A round character is a well-developed three-dimensional character with a history, a backstory, motivations, and opinions. And the reader can start to understand them with nuance and understand the decisions they make and why they make them. There are not a ton of round characters in Othello. I would argue that Othello is a round character and Iago is a round character. And uh, maybe Emilia becomes a round character after her speech that she gives about you know, cheating husbands. Uh, but we really don't, I mean, we know who Desdemona's dad is. Uh, and there's a little bit that she says here and there that you might be able to make the argument that Desdemona is a round character, but Cassio, do we know anything about his backstory? No. Bianca, Rodrigo, like there's a lot of characters that are not round characters. The vast majority of characters in any story are what we call flat characters. It's an undeveloped two-dimensional character. We don't know enough about their history or their backstory or their motivations or their opinions to be able to understand why they make the decisions that they do. They just make the decisions and uh, move the plot forward. And the vast majority of characters that you run into are flat characters. Lodovico, Graciano, Montano, um, Bianca, a lot of these characters are flat characters. Uh, and so you should be able to find the distinction between characters, identify which characters are which and why. Uh, then you have static characters and dynamic characters. Uh, this is what your essay is about. So this one should be pretty straightforward. A static character is a character who does not change in personality, morality, or outlook over the course of the story, whereas a dynamic character does change uh, in some fundamental internal way, not external, but internal. So uh, a lot of you are writing about Othello and the change he goes through that makes him a dynamic character. That's a perfectly uh, legitimate thing to do. I would argue that Iago is a static character. Iago is a round character. We know a lot about him, but he's not dynamic because he doesn't change. He stays the same throughout the entire story from beginning to end. He's an evil douchebag um, all the way up until you know the last scene. Whereas Othello drastically changes from a good guy to a murderous, you know, husband, and maybe back to a good guy at an end. That's at the end. It's debatable. We could we could talk about that. Uh, any questions so far? You guys still still with me? I know it's a long review, but I want to make sure that you you know all of these things and, and get them. All right. I think the last bit is uh, the differentiation between acts and scenes. Hopefully, that's pretty straightforward to you. The play Othello is in acts and scenes. Um, acts tend to uh, be a, a bunch of time and places that are connected, like act one was all in Venice at night, 
and act two is Cyprus. Um, they arrive at site, so we move to a different location. Um, and then act three is Cyprus in the garden outside of Othello's castle. And then, you know, eventually we get to act five, which is Cyprus at night. And so time moves forward through the acts. But if you look at the individual scenes, um, they'll all be close together in time and place, and they tend to be contiguous. Um, so scene one of act two is a seaport. They're waiting for the ships to come in, right? And they have that conversation about uh, their, their fear that Othello's ship might have been destroyed. We find out the Turkish fleet has been destroyed and all that kind of stuff. And then when, wish I had picked a different act. S scene two, we have a herald announcing that hey, there's gonna be a party that night. Scene three, we go to nighttime. Um, this is the drunky scene. And that's, that's the whole act. So we have these three scenes that progress one, two, three. They're all in Cyprus. They all happen right next to each other, but each one is like a, a chunk of time progressing forward. So when you're looking at, where was I? When you're looking at Renaissance uh, terms, uh, an act is a large chunk of a play generally representing a relatively contiguous unit of time and location. Uh, Greek plays were in three acts, or in one act, later plays were in three acts, and Shakespeare writes in five acts. So we have five act plays. Uh, you've seen this and how it works as tragedies generally start with an act introducing the characters, images, symbols, and themes. Following this act two generally shows things going well for the protagonist. Othello's marriage was perfectly fine through the end of act two. Act three has an event that causes the fortunes of the protagonist to turn. Iago convinces him that his wife is cheating on him. Act four takes viewers to the brink of a tragedy that could in theory still be avoided. And then act five is when the tragic events occur and the protagonist seals his or own doom due to their character flaw. All of Shakespeare's tragedies follow that same trajectory. If you know it, you can understand the tragedies themselves. And then we have scenes, acts are broken into a number of scenes. Scenes are generally much more limited in time and space than the act and they flow in a chronological order. So that's it, those are all the terms. Um, you know, if you know all those, you should do fine on the assessment as long as you know the story of Othello well and you've been paying attention day in and day out, not just ghosting on the on the lectures. Uh, let's talk themes really quick here. Uh, so we've looked at a number of themes and a number of the questions on the assessment are going to ask you to connect something to a theme or lesson. Uh, I, th I think I've got, um, it's going to start out with some sort of long answer questions that are going to ask you uh, some more specific things about scenes or characters, and then you're going to have to connect them to themes, and then there's going to be short answer questions, which are often like, find me an example of this, or find me an example of that, and they're, they're a lot quicker and easier to answer, um, and I think that's most of your assessment right there, uh, and I'm going to give you some choice, so like I'll have like, I don't know, uh, with the with the long answer questions, I think I I can't remember whether I gave you five questions and asked you to answer three of them, or whether I gave you four questions and asked you to answer three of them. But um, there's a smaller number that you have to answer, uh, whereas the short answer questions you got to answer all of them. Uh, but that's that's sort of how this the thing's structured. Am I am I lagging over there? I suddenly got a notification that my internet connection is unstable. Are you guys seeing any lag? Okay, good. All right, so when we go through themes in Othello, I went over these last time, so I don't want to spend forever on them. Uh, your central, your most important, probably an easiest to identify theme is jealousy represented by poison. Iago is jealous of basically everyone. Um, he's jealous of Cassio for getting his job. He's jealous because he thinks his wife is cheating on him with either Othello or Cassio or both. He's jealous of Othello and Desdemona's relationship, maybe because he loves Othello. Uh, you know, and then you got Bianca who thinks that Cassio is cheating on her because she found this handkerchief, uh, you know, and so you, you end up with lots of sort of moments of jealousy, but in every situation where jealousy appears, it is destroying the relationship um, around itself. So jealousy is a poison, metaphorically, uh, a relationship is a body and the poison kills the body. Uh, once it is um, injected. So then we have loss of innocence. Uh, again, we looked at the allegory that this may be an allegory for the Garden of Eden scene, and that's the story of the loss of innocence of humanity in the Bible. So 
if there's a connection there, uh, it's this idea that Othello was, was pure and innocent and sort of lived in his own paradise with his happiness, with his love, but him gaining quote unquote knowledge of her cheating on him uh, and then acting upon it uh, results in his loss of innocence, uh, his loss of happiness. And uh, you know, the thing about uh, the Garden of Eden scene with the tree of knowledge is once you gain knowledge, you can't go back, you can't return to a state of innocence. And the same thing I think is true also of jealousy, that once you, you give into it, it's impossible to get away from. Um, and I wish there was a more uplifting message that you could come out of it with, but I don't know that there is. Uh, love and trust, uh, you know, you can look at the, the ideas here is how important trust is to a loving relationship. Uh, once Othello, or Desdemona loses Othello's trust, pretty much everything falls apart. But there's a lot of losses of trust in this story. There's the loss that uh, of trust that used to exist between Cassio and Othello, that disappears. Not just the one with um, Othello and Desdemona. Uh, and that ties in with the idea of appearance versus reality, right? Like Iago seems good on the outside and everybody calls him honest and trusts him throughout the entire story, but he's really evil. And Desdemona is made to look evil, but she's really good. And so people judge, and, and people judge Othello on his appearance all the time. So there's a real warning, I think, in Othello about judging by appearances and taking um, what you see on the surface to be reality, because it often is not. We already talked about racial discrimination, I think, a little bit today, so we're good there. Uh, tying into that is gender roles. Again, we talked about the three characters, Emilia as a wife, Desdemona as a virgin, and Bianca as a whore, and these three roles. Uh, we look at Emilia's speech about how men treat women um, and how they make assumptions about women, um, and women are, are humans. We're all human beings. You shouldn't judge somebody based on their gender or their race, for that matter. Um, you know, you need to get to know them, and you don't need to get to know their surface them. You need to get to know who they are in reality and uh, base your your judgments about them on that. Um, her speech essentially says that uh, women are like men and they have all the same weaknesses and frailties and desires that men have, uh, but they get branded differently than men and men's uh, weaknesses and frailties and desires are accepted by society, whereas women's are not. Uh, and that's not fair. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So on some levels, Shakespeare's way ahead of his time with a lot of the things that he's doing in Othello with um, themes in terms of both gender roles and racial discrimination. Is he sexist and racist? I think by modern standards, I don't know how you can say no when you look at what his characters say, when you look at how the play ends up. Uh, but, you know, it certainly makes you think, it makes you, makes you consider. Hopefully you guys have all had some some good thoughts or discussions about the play with each other. Um, I know there's not a lot of talk that goes on in my class. Uh, if I try and get you guys to talk, it's just, you know, crickets. Um, but I've had some good conversations in office hours or, or with students when I see them. Um, yeah, I think that's just about everything. Uh, does anybody have any individual questions? All right, let me stop um the recording here and